impact of the pandemic on various groups, which is very apt and necessary to discuss and spread the word around how to deal with these uncertain situations and lend a hand to support those who are in need of. This one moment can mean the word to someone who can, can change their outlook towards life. It brings me immense pleasure to have our speakers, Dr. Ramnik Auja and Mrs. Lakshmi Alagappan for today's session. Dr. Ramnik and Mrs. Lakshmi have been associated with many social causes in Singapore towards welfare of our community. We appreciate your passion and dedication for your chosen charitable causes. And we would like to learn more about that. I'm sure that our today's discussion on mental, social, and emotional well-being will contribute towards our knowledge while sharing our concerns. Indeed, there will be a big takeaway for each one of us. We welcome all our members to this session and let's hear more from the speakers. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Shweta, for your uh, introduction. So may I invite C.A. Pratima to introduce our speakers. Pratima? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Kala. Dear members, it is my pleasure to introduce two most wonderful guest speakers for today, whose work in their respective fields speaks volumes of their selfless service to the society. We have with us Dr. Ramnik Ahuja and Mrs. Lakshmi Alagappan. Dr. Ramnik is a physician and public health professional with over 21 years of experience in the healthcare industry across various roles and capacities. He's a certified first responder for trauma survivors and is currently involved with counseling and providing assistance as a helpline. She supports low income women in Singapore as a befriender at a forum called Daughters of Tomorrow. Over the years, uh, she has actively participated in fundraising activities in association with global health agencies, such as World Health Organization, Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria, and World Economic Forum, among others, and has led various teams in the projects on public health trends in India and other parts of Asia. She has also published research papers in scientific journals and led research studies for various global agencies. Moving on to our next speaker, Mrs. Lakshmi Alagappan. She's a trained social work professional with close to service with the Salvation Army in Singapore in a flagship rehab center that provides residential care to children and youth. With a standing sound authority in child protection services, she has held various positions influencing a large continuum of service providers within the out-of-home care sector. She specializes in Children and Young Persons Act, counseling services, and promoting care plans and permanency planning for families. She has held many positions in the organizing teams and inter-ministry committees within the Ministry of Social and Family Development and liaises with various ministries and media through the course of her work in Singapore. Currently, she is providing professional services towards consultation and counseling support for children, youth, and families. With that, we welcome both our speakers and invite them to open the session. Ma'am, over to you. Uh, Kala, who is going first? Uh, Hi, I was not after Ramnik. I'll, I'll, I'll set the floor for the evening. Thank you so much. And thank you for this lovely evening. And I'm sure each one of us looking forward to the long weekend. Uh, the flow of the evening is that I'm going to just spend some few minutes through some slides to talk generally about uh, emotional well-being. And what is very important, as you did mention, Shweta, that one moment can make a huge difference in the lives of people. And uh, so it would be, I would want to kind of, between me and Lakshmi, we really wanted to kind of talk more about, you know, the difference between when we talk about mental health and illness, there is a difference between when mental illness and mental wellness. Uh, are we actually prepared? If we see somebody in distress, are we actually prepared? Uh, do we have the coping mechanisms? And especially paying more attention to a vulnerable age group, that's youth and our children. And, uh, and there are many ways where we can support them. There are resources available. There's a pool of resources that are available. But more so very important for us is do we have the coping mechanisms to, 
provide the support not only for ourselves, but also those who are in need and are we able to help them to access the services? So setting the ball rolling here, start with, you know, general thing about what is emotional well-being and mental health and wellness. So we do know that well-being has many components. And before I get kind of go into the slides, uh, what Lakshmi and I decided was the fact that we would not talk about numbers, statistics, data, et cetera, because there is a huge, it's an endless pool of numbers, resources that are available. And I think over the years, we all have been kind of making lifestyle changes or picking up initiatives or behaviors, which we feel are positive for us. We have been working on ourselves. So we are not going to look up to any of those strategies, but specifically looking up to what are some important things with the coping mechanisms where we can help people who are in need. Yes, like I did mention over the recent years, there has been a huge acknowledgement about importance of emotional well-being and mental well-being and its importance, it stands true to us in every moment of our lives. Emotional well-being. This has been something which has been also talked to a larger extent by WHO. When we look into the definition of health uh, by WHO, it does mention that it is the uh, not only absence of disease, but it is social, mental, and emotional well-being. So when we say that emotionally healthy people, being emotionally healthy doesn't mean that you have to be happy, laughing, smiling all the time. It means that we have the empowerment within ourselves that we are aware of our emotions we can deal with them, whether they are positive or negative. And if we are emotionally healthy, doesn't mean that we don't get the stress and anger. So somewhere, if you look into the larger population, anybody who has anxiety, has psychological or emotional distress, people tend to label them as there is some problem, there is some mental issue. And lately the government, especially in Singapore, has coined a terminology called mental health conditions. This is to ensure that we are covering up everybody who needs help that is mental wellness, that is could be your anxiety, depression, or mental illness, there would be your uh, disease such as bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and so on. So when you're emotionally empowered, you know that you need help and you are able to seek help. So going on to the emotions, we know emotions aren't good or bad, but they are a trigger for us to help us know that there is something wrong and we should be actually seeking help. There are many ways where we can improve or maintain our emotional health. That is letting go, letting go. For example, if we need, if we look at something in a house and we feel, does it bring joy to us? Does it, does it not? If it does not, we are happy to let go of it. Same way we need to deal with our emotions. Are they bringing us joy? If not, if they're not bringing us joy, how can we work on ourselves to let go of them? and reaching out for help. Like I did mention, here is the biggest stigma and discrimination associated with mental health conditions. That actually um, is a huge gap in terms of that at one level we have resources, at the other level we, we have people who need help, right? And how do we kind of bridge this gap so that they were able to help and support people and help them to access services? So before I go any further, I would like to just kind of leave, uh, you know, go through this, help you to go through this video where we are talking about in case we have anybody in distress who reaches out to us, what are the three things, the minimal three things which we can do? We can listen to them, we can empathize with them, and we can validate their strengths being in that situation. And here it goes. Okay, I think there's something wrong with the video is just a second. If you could just bear with me. Okay, I think I'll have to kind of get back to it again uh, and run it towards the end of the presentation. So at the end, to start with that, how we think, feel, and act is actually influenced by mental health. And I always kind of feel very joyful when I kind of 
uh, go through this beautiful comic strip of Calvin and Hobbes. You know, everybody seeks happiness, but happiness is not enough for me. I demand euphoria. So that was emotional well-being, that how are we actually dealing with our emotions? Are we letting the emotions actually overcome us? Are we being able to control our emotions and see whether they are harming us in a larger part of our life? Are we able to access services? Where do we reach out to help? The other spectrum from emotional well-being is comes to mental wellness, which is a positive side where we are looking into the absence of more than just the mental illness. Stress, anxiety, like I did mention, are normal emotions. And like going in all these experience of all these years, we come across people where they have a lot of emotional overwhelmness. There is a lot of emotional distress. But some way we need to understand that sadness and anxiety are very normal emotions. They protect us and they cause us to act, which is healthy. But if we let these emotions, the sadness and anxiety actually prolong for a longer period of time, then it becomes a distressing situation which it starts interfering with our daily life. And Shweta, like you did mention about the importance of well-being in the new normal. We do know that emergence of COVID has impacted our lives in many ways. That's the reason that we are now kind of looking up to a new normal life. We may not go back to the earlier normal life. It has actually adopted us to, uh, sorry, it has actually asked us to kind of look into the challenges, adopt new ways. And one of these things actually has led us to is there is this increased need of our mental awareness. We are looking up to, we are looking into resources that are already there. And this pandemic has actually revealed a need for more of mental health support. And as, as a professional who's been at, uh, at the health line, we have seen an increased uh, number of calls that have been coming in to the health lines. And they could be as simple, not necessarily that everyone who's calling in has a mental illness. It's for simple thing. You are in, you're having a bout of anxiety. You are in a situation which is leading on to a distress. You feel you are unsafe. All these situations do call out for you to reach out for help. And there are resources, there are professionals who are there to help you, providing a listening uh, ear or providing the emotional support across the spectrum of our lives. Like I did mention that there's a difference between mental wellness and mental illness. What is mental illness? When we are coping with small stresses in our life, it could be as simple as insomnia, it could be simple stress, and these, these small uh, episodes do come into our lives on a daily basis where some way we may not even realize it. We may feel so empowered that we're so emotionally positive that we are able to overcome it. Managing mental health crisis and art of relaxation. This is a very small bubble of mental wellness. Anything beyond it, and in case these situations tend to prolong for a longer period of time, they lead on to mental illness. If you just kind of take a step back and we kind of close our eyes for a few seconds and just kind of take on this mental wellness challenge, what's one thing you can change in your day to improve your mental health? Or maybe one thing you took up during the day which helped you to improve your mental health, maybe. That's up to you, you don't have to speak out, but maybe it's just kind of erecting for us that did we even think about this? Did we even kind of pause uh, to give in few seconds, not even few minutes to ourselves? That's something we should actually kind of pay attention to. And as I mentioned that mental illnesses can be anything from mood anxiety disorders, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Here lies the important difference between mental wellness and mental illness, is that there are a lot of factors around us which affect our mental wellness, but mental illness does have a physical cause. And that physical cause are the triggers in our life. And these triggers could be just for a few minutes, but they can last even for years. And the overwhelming response to these triggers can be after many years. If we are in a situation where that trigger tends to exist for a longer period of time. And these triggers are genetic. Genetic, sometimes the mental illness 
disorders do have a genetic predisposition and the most common which we come across is Alzheimer's dementia. Psychological. Psychological is that when we feel that there are uh, uh, there are distressing situations around us, right? And it leads on to stress and anxiety. Life events and stresses. I think this is the most important uh, trigger factor in our life, which encompasses everything from education, our performance, our social relationships, our familial relationships, our social connections, relocation. I think what we go through on our daily life is something which comes under this whole umbrella of life events and uh, stresses. Medical health conditions, when there are defects uh, pertaining to our uh, brain system, that would be, it is a huge, and we would not be going into that in detail at all. And personality, we have like uh, Hobbs and Briggs, if one would have gone through their 17, 16 uh, personality traits, right? And each one of us does have a very, uh, inherent personality trait and somewhere when we there is a kind of an imbalance it leads on to distress anxiety or stress in our life one very important factor which we're seeing in today's world where technology has made huge inroads is the social media factor that is cyber bullying and cyber stalking and especially when it comes to your vulnerable age group, that's the children and the youth. And we also see huge cases of technology facilitated sexual violence. This is something, and I think Lakshmi would be kind of talking in detail about this vulnerable age group, that's our youth and the uh, children. So if you are aware that you're not functioning as you normally do, you know something is wrong, I think it is a time. It is, it's an alarm that should go us uh, in us that if we are empowered that something is happening and perhaps we need to kind of seek help about it. So remember, there is a difference between having a couple of bad days, that's fine. Each one of us goes through it. But having prolonged period of, uh, periods of bad days that may deliberate us or prevent us from doing anything else is something that is where we need to kind of not feel embarrassed. As a first step, we can look up to a close contact, could be a family member or a friend. Try and disclose to them if you have the trust and you feel that the person, whatever you share is going to be confidential. That is one key word which is there when we talk about mental wellness and mental illness is maintaining the confidentiality of the person who is open or who's trusting you to kind of share what they're going through, what the situation is, and they are reaching out. They've taken the first step and you have to kind of validate their strengths. You have to provide the empathy and you have to listen to them. So yes, if you're having prolonged periods of bad days, uh, sorry, bad days, that is where you should kind of look up to seeking help. And we also know, we do understand the fact that once triggered, if we do not seek help, it can increase the difficulties and it can also kind of push one person towards the risk of illness. As man has made progress, there are more interventions, there are strategies, there are resources to support us than ever before. But the gap is like I did mention between people needing care and how are we helping them to access remains substantial. And I always firmly believe, and I think everyone would agree to the fact as that no one should be left behind due to lack of access to resources or services. We should try and do our best as minimum. It could be a small effort. It could be a small, we may have just spent one minute to maybe five minutes to maybe hours with the person just providing that listening ear. That goes a big way in helping that person reaching out for help. The other side of when we're talking about mental health conditions is that despite the progress which we have made, there is a huge stigma that is attached just to the word mental health. In a larger population, the moment you mention a lot of the word mental health, it takes people on to the larger other side of the spectrum. Mm, it's mental illness. Mm, that means there is depression, there is uh, anxiety, 
there is um, schizophrenia and it can be endless. But one, like I did mention, it is very important for us to understand that there is a huge demarcation between mental illness and mental wellness. And it's mental wellness is where, where a large amount of efforts need to go to ensure that people who are having anxiety and depression for a prolonged period of time do not end up in the larger end of the spectrum, which is the mental illness. The stigma, yes, it's okay not to be okay. And you know, man is an, an amazing creature. We have done amazing, we have split the atom, we have uh, composed music that stirs our souls, but we are still grappling with small issues in our life where we are still discriminating people who need our help, who are in distress. For years, and I think even today, we do come across campaigns on a daily basis and where we are focusing on social stigmas surrounding mental illness. Efforts are being made on a daily basis, but we still need to see the fruits of these efforts. There is a huge gap, huge amount of um, bridging that needs to be done between access uh, to the resources that are available. Public understanding is lacking. And it is very much, for example, I'm, I'm sure, I, I do not know, but in the larger population if a person comes across anyone who would be a family member or in the social contact or maybe in your community, and you see that the person is, you feel as if the behavior of the person is not normal, you tend to kind of compartmentalize that person and say, okay, simply irrational. You need to have the ability to be able to sympathize with that person. That is the most and most important thing. Because typically people tend to say, okay, people, those who have mental health conditions, they are crazy. That's typically the terminology that's used. They are violent, they are harmful. They should be kept away from the society. Unfortunately, these are things which were uh, of the past because of the help and support and resources that are available. We need to kind of mainstream each and every one of them into our normal daily lives, into our society. Like I did mention, young people and children are more prone because that's the developmental phase. They tend to forming their identity and Lakshmi would be talking in much more detail regarding the challenges that are there and what are the coping mechanisms to look into their behavior. The problem is that we are not feel, do we feel we are equipped? So maybe we can just kind of take a step back and think, are each one of us actually uh, equipped to support those who are living with a mental health condition. Because for example, you're stepping out into the mall and you all of a sudden come across a distressful condition. It may be a person who has had an attack of anxiety, right? Are we equipped to deal with that person? What would we do at that point of time? Are we going to simply dial for uh, emergency health services? Or are we going to kind of provide that space to that person so the person is able to calm down? Yes, they would need help. But in those few minutes, are we able to help that person? What actions would we be able to take to do so and move in that line? How can I help? That's a question that one needs to ask each one of us, needs to do it on a daily basis. I think what is more important, and this is what I really would want to spend next few minutes is talking about. The first few slides were just talking about what is emotional being, well-being, what is emotional wellness, what is, um, uh, sorry, mental wellness, what is mental illness. But what is more important, we know there are triggers in, the, uh, in our society, in our daily lives. We know there is a stigma. But what is so very important is that how do we help? And here are these few coping mechanisms, which you don't need to undergo a training to be in that situation where you feel, yes, you are empowered to help the people. This is what you can do. Set time aside with no distractions. For example, if you have somebody around you who you feel does need help, you need to build up the rapport with that person. And how do you do that? You set time aside with no distractions. Let them, give them that space. Let them share as much as or as little as they want to. Sometimes you may feel that you're sitting with the person and it may be just absolutely stillness around. The person may not utter a single word and that may go on for minutes, that's fine. Your body language plays a very important part when you have, when you're trying to build up the rapport or the confidence with that person. 
don't try to diagnose. It's a human tendency. The moment we hear something about someone, we are jumping right to quick solution. Mm, yes, I think I know it. I know what the diagnosis is. No, we are not. We do not have that knowledge. We do not have that empowerment. We do not have that skill. We are here to help that person, right? And how do we do that? We are not jumping to conclusions, nor are we trying to guess their, uh, second guess their feelings, right? For example, we should not be asking them a question. I know how you're feeling. I think you have this, this, this. That's the worst, worst way to go about it. The person may just kind of feel shut because you have to provide that space, that empathy to that person. You have to say, I think I can understand what you're going through. It is a very difficult and challenging situation. It is not your fault. Just, taking, just speaking these few sentences can bring about a huge change and building up that trust in that person or giving that confidence to that person. Yes, there is someone who is able to empathize, who can understand the difficult situation I am in. You can always say, you don't feel like disclosing, that's okay. Take deep breaths, take a step back, take care of yourself. Take care of your emotions. And I'm here for you. I'm here to support you. Give that space to the person and keep the questions open-ended. Don't, don't close the questions. Open-ended questions means, yes, I can understand what you're going through. Not, I think I know what you're going through. So that's like kind of jumping onto diagnosis. Yes, I understand what you're going through. I empathize. I understand your concerns. Thank you for reaching out to me. Thank you for taking that first step to talk about your situation. Simultaneously, as you're building up and providing that space, you can, where you feel that the person has given you that space, you can talk about well-being. I think we can talk towards taking care of yourself. Let's take that first step. How would you like to go about it? I'm here for you. I'm holding the space for you. I'm here to support you. Just kind of, maybe you might feel that it is a repetition of uh, providing that space. It's a repetition of repeating the same words, but yes, one needs to understand. It is reinforcing, reinforcing the trust, reinforcing providing that space to that person. And if you have to validate their strengths, which is very equally important, you have to listen carefully to what they tell you. Just pick up one or two words. Yes, I understand. I validate what you are saying. I can understand the emotional overwhelming that's happened. I can understand the distress what you're going through. This is listening carefully. Just picking up one or two words with the person is saying and just validating their strengths. You are kind of creating the space you are providing them the support you're validating their strengths and again it's a vicious cycle you'd keep on coming back to these few things only and that is how you're building up the strength uh, and the trust with the person that the person is able to kind of open up more and more in the concern you are more like a a passive individual who's there because in your mind you have to keep on saying and you have to be strong enough and you should keep on kind of Keep on working on yourself saying, yes, I'm here to help that person. I'm here to provide that support to validate their strength. Offer them in seeking professional support may or may not happen. Because to reach this level, to reach this part where you have kind of listened to them, you have given them that trust that you're there to support them. You should not jump the bandwagon and say, okay, I understand what you're going through. Should we kind of seek support? Instead, it should be, I think I can help you. How do you feel about it? Do you think I would be able to support you? How do you think you would want my support? It's leaving those, those concerns, leaving, leaving that empowerment with that person, giving them that respect, giving them that too, that yes, you are part, you are in charge of your life still. Nothing has been taken away from you. But yes, in addition to that, I'm there, there to help you. And it is again, like I did mention, working on these things again. I'm here for you, I'm there to support you, I'm here to validate. But yes, in this situation, it takes a little bit of a turn in terms that if you feel that the person is actually susceptible to self-harm, or if you feel the person is safe, 
I'm sorry, unsafe. And it would be not only that the person is into self-harming, but also the current situation. Is the person still undergoing abuse? It could be physical abuse, it could be verbal abuse, it could be uh, physical violence, right? So one needs to be very, very careful to understand when the person starts disclosing whether they are in a safe environment or not. And at any point of time, we feel that the person is unsafe is a time when you have to actually kind of reach out to emergency services. But one needs to be very, very careful for the fact that the consent of the person has to be taken. We cannot reach out. We cannot, for example, if we have somebody as a friend or into a, in our uh, near circle where we feel that the person is in distress, needs help. We cannot kind of just take, we know the name of the person, we know where the person lives and we kind of reach out to the organizations or uh, you know, to the various, maybe call up the helpline and say, look, I need, I think I have a friend who is in distress and I think they need help. We cannot do that. We need to have the consent of a person unless and until in that situation where the person is a person is uh, a minor, yes. Mm -hmm. Or uh, you feel that the person is really in an unsafe a uh, situation or a place where you should be able to help a person with resources so that they're able to move out from that safe environment or reach out to a resource. And the first place where one can always ring up is called dial up for police. They're always there. They're always there. And if one would have paid attention that early in part of this year in April, the government has set up a helpline. There are various helplines for various concerns, but one such helpline is the National Anti-Violence Helpline or a National Care Hotline. Here you have individuals, you have professionals who are sitting there to take the calls. And within 10 to 15 minutes, you have investigating officers that are able to reach out to the person who's in distress. And these are more situations where you feel that the person is unsafe and the safety of the person is a big question. And else, in most of the situations where the person has to kind of reach out for access to resources, a big, big the consent of the person has to be there. Right? And but naturally we need to know our limits and knowing our limits is what I did talk about is that we need to have the consent of the person on board. So yes, it is imperative that we need to start talking about it. We should not feel embarrassed. We should not shy about our emotional, mental wellness or illness. We should develop adequate positive coping mechanism and communication skills. There are huge resources that are available. There are e-modules that are there. We can sit for half an hour when we have the time, go through these e-modules, which will give us more information or give us the skills, you know, the communication skills or the coping mechanisms where we feel that, yes, we have the confidence that we are able to uh, reach out, help support people who would reach out to us with their concerns. And at the end, and uh, before I hand over the floor to Lakshmi, uh, at the end of the session, we, we have, I have put up a slide, uh, we've put in resources which are there. And I think that's something which should be there for each one of us. We know that resource is there so that we know in case a person needs help, which is the first place where we can reach out for them, right? Uh, thank you so much. This was very general. And like I did mention at the beginning, that we are here as uh, professionals uh, for you to reach out to us. If you have any questions, we would leave the floor open for question and answers after Lakshmi's uh, presentation. And I do hope we have a discussion. Else, uh, you can reach out to us uh, in confidence in case you need any help. Lakshmi, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramnik. I think. Um, you've given an absolute overview of uh, the entire process in terms of, you know, signs, symptoms, and um, some of the skills that you can actually practice and also to reach out. Yeah, it's, it's so wholesome. Yeah, if I was listening, wow, it's like, it, it's just going through in, in order. Uh, thank you so much for that. I think what I would basically do is, um, let me just share my screen. Okay, um, what I'm planning to do is because we have gone through the, the entire, the, in terms of the social, mental and emotional well-being part of it, um, what I thought is I will just touch a little on the children and young persons, you know, basically, how do we manage them, you know, uh, what are some of the challenges that 
we will have with them and how do we interfere in terms of um, managing them. Emotional well-being, as we know, as has been uh, reiterated so many times here, that it is totally imperative that everyone has that kind of emotional stability and the ability to function. Um, it is not so much of, you know, not getting emotional, but absolutely how, how do we manage those emotions? I think in that sense, if you want to go to, um, let me get this going. Okay. I'm going to look at uh, managing children in particular, because, you know, you may be wondering, because you've touched a, a, a holistic view of all of those uh, in terms of the mental wellness. I'm just going to look at particular about managing children. And then we will probably take questions uh, if you have on the overview of it. Yeah, I think I would just want all of you to just, you know, I know that some of you um, who is currently, you know, you know, off camera, but if you're listening, just take a moment, think about a situation where you had absolutely no ways to deal with the behavior that you saw and that you felt wit's end, tearing your hair and not being able to deal with the situation. Um, We've all got children, right? I'm sure so many on the floor and families of this uh, ICA group have children, young children and, uh, and grown up. You can think of uh, not only that, even the spouses or family members, if you have a challenging behavior, what do we do? Yeah, just, just think about it because we would come to a stage that, you know, it's absolutely, yeah, we just want to give up. Sometimes we even joke and play that, you know, oh, I had enough, I wish... Uh, you know, I had no children or I had all the resources to manage the children. So it can be that tough. Um, we'll be talking about some of the examples of challenging behavior is you've heard your children say, right, stress. Everything is stressed these days today. They say, oh, I'm stressed about school. I'm stressed about this. I know at home and, you know, Amma said this, Appa said this, you know, all kinds of stresses. And they don't even know what they mean by stress. But that word is used so often. Yeah, sometimes you see behaviors with children or young people at home that they get very withdrawn. You know, if you see them in mood swings, like um, they keep changing. Uh, one day they're fine and bouncing, kicking, happy to go. And suddenly you just see them so withdrawn. They don't want to participate. They don't want to eat. They don't want to do anything. They don't want to listen to you. And then you keep wondering, wow. What is this, you know, why are you changing? And then we go rattling, oh, you weren't like that a while ago and what's happening? So if you see those mood swings, some of them have bedwetting issues. Bedwetting can be like, you know, something very uh, normal. You know, it happens once in a while, to series of, you know, uh, bedwetting issues that children feel very embarrassed about or even youngsters, even youth for that matter. Um, they are very shy and they do not want to come and talk to you about it. A lot of you know school issues. Would have heard about school phobia, and with all the recent examples that's happening these days, we know that um, it's not easy having children with behavioral issues at home. Truancy is another one. I mean, right now everyone is going on online, but uh, can you imagine if they were in school and uh, they do not attend school, they run away or they leave home without telling you, or they just go to friend's house and they don't want to come back. And isolation. Isolation can also be in, in many forms, you know, that um, they just keep away from relationships or they don't want to mingle with all your friends or relatives. So if you see all of these behaviors, sometimes we wonder, we feel all alone. Yeah. And uh, I, I used to have support groups where parents come and say, oh, I thought that was only in my family. And I was so shy to talk about it. But later they realized that everyone in the group is sharing to say, yeah, everyone has seen these behaviors, right? So these are some challenging behaviors that children and youth, yeah, they go through on a daily basis. Sometimes you see that a bit extensive, then you can start thinking about it. So I'm just giving you examples, you know, um, because it's very hard, it's, a, it's, an, it's an ocean of a topic um, to let you know everything. So we'll just pick um, certain um, modes of behavior and we can, we can go from there. Or if you have questions, you can always come back and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so far okay? Good. Let me go to the next one. Then comes just the opposite. So you have disruptive behaviors to the core. How many of you, I'm sure you would have seen that you have children who are angry all the time. 
angry about what? It can be food, it can be anything at home that I don't like this, I don't like this. You know, uh, she said that, I said that, and being argumentative, you know, arguing, we yeah, are back to back questioning authority, temper tantrums, you know, playing uh, tantrums all the time, swearing sometimes, uh, or screaming or refusing to follow instructions. All this can happen on a daily basis at, at homes, right? But when you see these behaviors in an extreme sense that it is um, something that you can't manage and you see it coming very often, then you may want to think about it, yeah? And then that's the time you can start looking for support or at least talking to somebody about it first. So these are some of the behaviors that I've seen in practice and I've also seen in terms of families come forward and yeah, they do let us know. When we look at uh, why do children behave the way they do? What are some of the triggers? Why does, you know, so much changes happen all of a sudden? Um, your reasons could be, you know, we all know hormonal changes. Can you think of yourselves growing up? You've had so many changes that you've seen. And um, sometimes you're not even, you know, able to, to spell it out. You don't have a voice for it. You don't have words for it. And you struggle. So those are kind of an aggression uh, during puberty. This is sometimes it's very normal, but if it just goes again, it's, it's a scale. We always look at a scale of zero to 10 and we wanna see how often, what's the pattern, why do they behave this way? So we will also start assessing such behaviors. Frustrations at being told off, does this happen in all the households? I mean, do you see that happening? Many a times they don't want to listen or they don't want to be, they will always feel that they are not understood. It's a famous, you know, standard statement. Hey, you don't understand me. You, you don't listen to me. You don't know what I'm going through. So if you're hearing that, please pay an attentive ear. Yeah. Sometimes they can get very upset or distressed about things that is, you know, if, if you just change all of a sudden. Hey, suppose you have a routine and everything is going quite smooth and suddenly you see them reacting or changes, then that is something that, yeah, probably it's also a trigger. This, this, all this is, we call them the non-verbal. I mean, they're not able to express, but things are happening in, in their life. Depression, again, a big word. Everybody uses that. Uh, oh, I'm depressed. I'm going through this. I'm anxious. Uh, sometimes it can even be just an excitement. They just don't know how to balance those emotions. So it comes out as negative. Again, all these triggers are things that we see. So what I'm saying is for this group, for what we need to understand is, please take note of it. When you see a change, when you see things are not normal or things that actually starts making you to wonder, then just start jotting them or noting them down. It can also be sometimes just the boredom, you know, very, very used to that, uh, you know, same old things happening. And now with all these recent changes and the pandemic, yeah, not to say that everyone at home is stressed to some extent, because there is no stimulation, you don't get to be the norm. And you know, children are going through so much in their mind, they're not able to understand or comprehend all these changes. There's a lot of why, 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 what's gonna happen next? You know, what's gonna happen to our family? Will I lose anyone? What is the story? So there is so much happening around us. So what we will just do is, I mean, I'm just going to give you some very basic tips. I mean, I'm sure, yeah, we've heard Dr. Ramnik speak as well. So there's a lot of things that she's also mentioned. So I'm just going to add on and probably when you give us more, you know, in terms of what your thinking is or the flow of thought, then we can also go deeper into that. So I'm just going to touch a bit on some of the um, actions that you can take. And then we can just use this as a, um, you know, just as a tip back home. I mean, if it is useful. Um, how do you converse with children? You know, like um, how do you how do you communicate? Uh, Dr. Ramnik took us through quite a bit in communication. I mean, she she said how you can listen, how you can ask in terms of open-ended questions, how you can just be there for them. I think we just need to take note that being there for them. And uh, I only want to stress, uh, absolutely stress one pointer: that your responses to children or young people, what works the best is with caring messages. The minute a youngster or a child knows that all your attempts is towards caring for them, um, that you mean what you say and you're not here to attack, you're not here to find out more, you're not intruding or investigating 
and uh, you do not rub their self-worth or self-image, they are absolutely, yeah, then the trust starts building. Once the trust builds, then they are able to open up a lot more free. When they start to talk a lot free, then you will be able to understand what's going through and what are some of the triggers that probably this poor child is struggling in terms of trying to share. Because we must remember, a lot of these things happen, the first, first line of communication happens at home or at school. Yeah, most of it when parents come, they say, oh, I've been watching this for a period of time, but I thought it was so normal. But suddenly, you know, it starts escalating. So when you, when you talk and when you find out things like this, just don't keep it to yourself. If you are concerned about it, please do approach help. And um, that has also been stressed quite a bit, right? Uh, in this topic today, that taking the first step, being aware and asking for help, asking for support is absolutely necessary, right? And at least if that is one key takeaway, then that's fantastic because all of us know it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to feel not okay, quoting Dr. Ramit's slide. And uh, when I say teach, it is not so much of, you know, um, top down. It's not just saying, hey, you learn this. You better learn this. You do this. Um, why I'm going to these kind of slides is I, I just want something very practical, something that you can just take and go and just use it the next day. If you see something happening within the family setting or the children that you come across, what are some of the things that you can do? Or you can just change yourself if you have not been um, doing so well in that area. Whenever you see a, a behavior, if you want to, you know, rather than attacking or getting into the actual behavior per se, deal with the situation first. What is happening? It is not the child. I think that the kid needs to know it is not the criticism is not at the child, but it is you're just reiterating the behavior that you see. And if you do not do that, what can happen is it can just pierce directly in and this child will tell you is gone because then they will start yeah, you know, distancing. They will not open up. They will not feel confident or comfortable. Uh, many in the sessions come back and then they will share, you, you know what? I mean, yeah, they call you auntie, whatever, Miss Ashmi, they'll say, oh, you can teach me all these skills. But you know what my family is all about? The minute I start talking, oh, it's one, you know, they start just attacking. It's a bomb. And why, why can I even speak? So, Children are struggling these days to get their opinions across, even to get their voice heard. It is so tough. Um, we all need to mind ourselves because in our own families, sometimes we do not allow open communication. And I'm going to be a bit strong and bold here because this is where we probably need to take. And I mean, if we're able to reach and take this pointer back, then that's going to help us a lot. Allow your children to voice what they need to say. And please offer reassurance and just be there. Just be there listening. And, and, and it will go to places if you get that relationship with your children, that trusting relationship. Leave alone the professionals and going out for help and all that. They all know what to do. But most of the damage happens at home. At home. And unfortunately, a lot of things that could have been easily rectified, taught and learned just gets destroyed. Just because, you know, it happens very young and, and they're not able to build themselves up, all their feelings and emotions start coming out to behaviors. Those are not acceptable. Yeah, so that would be good. So we're talking a little on role modeling, right? You guys know what, what we mean. Um, it's very important to walk the talk because basically if we can role model and be the one as such at home, then they know exactly, you know, you know where they're learning it from, right? Yeah, so that's very helpful to have this in your mind and then start just checking on ourselves as well. That's, that's very useful. Hey, and another thing that's so important is we talk about anger, right? Tell me who doesn't get angry. I think all of us do. We get angry for everything right now. I mean, yeah, your dinner is not up to the mark. You know what it is going to be like? Yeah, you've had a bad day or you think, you know, the points don't get to across to us in the right way or we're not able to get along. Anger is an emotion and it's a trigger. It can come, you know, it can come to anybody and, and it's okay to be angry. It's just that what you do, what you do when you get angry, how do you, how do you behave? 
And what are the things you do? I mean, it's interesting, even as an adult, we see ourselves doing that, right? Can you imagine children, the very young ones, you know, at families, they'll be watching, watching, yeah, mama and papa fighting, sometimes having a squabble, family disputes. So they get to see um, a lot of things that they shouldn't be seeing. But that's exactly where they learn, right? So if you are angry, even with your spouses, even with your family members, if you're angry, you need to describe what you see, what you feel. I mean, if you're given an opportunity, by the way, I don't know if it really happens. Many of our families, we, do, we probably do not give that much space to all of us to talk. But that's very important. If you allow people's voice to be heard, and then you can tell them exactly how you feel and describe what you see rather than just jumping into conclusions and then start blaming, shaming, you know, why I'm spending so much time on that. Um, come on, guys, I think we all do that. We all innocently do it, or sometimes it's just a mode of living. You know, we're so used to it. So why can't we just, you know, unlearn certain things and then relearn in terms of what we can do better? So we want to emphasize today, please express what you expect and also to learn to express anger without any damage. So if that, that is something that we can take away, how cool it can be, right? I mean, if you know how to tell, hey, you are angry. I mean, you try smiling, you probably get a snack. But if you try to say that, to say that, you know, being angry is an emotion, I understand. But please give me my opportunity to speak and you, I will be there to listen to yours as well, right? So there's something that we can teach our children, anger management. This is, again, on a very basic level, but um, profuse anger and people not, being able to hold themselves, get into a lot of issues. And those becomes, okay, the ODDs and all the other illnesses. I'm not, not going to go into that, just giving you a basic. And dishonesty, okay, why I bring this? Because all these points is what I took uh, for today's sharing is what families have presented. Or when you do support groups, you know, what does families uh, find it the hardest to deal with when it comes to behavior? And what do they come and share in groups and they say, hey, let's all, you know, look at um, a solution for this. How do you manage? So there was a family, you know, who was struggling in terms of, you know, why does my child always get to be very dishonest? Uh, he can actually just, just be plain about it. And then we come to understand there is a lot of provoking going on in the family that this poor kid has just learned defensive lying is the only way out. So that's again, that happens in families or in groups or in friends, because what he does is then he carries this to, to his friends or in school, and then it becomes a problem. So instead of dealing with it as a problem later on, we can start you know, giving our kids you know, space, basically that this doesn't become a defensive line. Okay, so I just added that for it. How can you get cooperation and yeah? What do we want? We want children to be cooperative, and we want them to be responsible. I mean, those are two big words that we are looking at for their growing up, right? So why do they resist us? This is only because they are not in tune with us. The trust is not there. The relationship is not there. The minute we have respect, and that's also been already spoken about. So if we have a respect, then you give them their space and be able to invite them for a cooperative, uh, responsible task. Say, suppose you do that in, in this COVID time, you know, to do activities at home, you have fun activities. What works best? It's only best when you have a shared kind of relationship or a task rather than a top-down approach. And I'm sure that teamwork, I don't have to emphasize enough, but that is the only thing that works for today's work life as well. So we can teach that in very young, the children to invite them to be cooperative and responsible. And how do you do that? By giving them the space and also to respect. So this, if we are able to just practice one or two of this, I think we'll go a long way. Okay, I know now it's a lot to do with assessment, online learning, you know, children are struggling. Um, they don't keep up time. They don't want to do homework. I'm sure moms here will be struggling as well. But if you're able to just, you know, just drop these things, just, just the two or three pointers to look at, you get them into a routine of involving them, drawing their own table in terms of what is the location? Where do I sit? 
a minute. I know that it is my assessment time. Where do I sit? Now you have no other place to sit but your laptops, right? So if you're sitting on the laptop at a particular time, uh, a schedule, then yeah, your work is a lot easier. I used to know moms struggle in terms of getting their work done and, you know, ah, how do you manage this? How do I take them to school in time? How do they get to finish it? Exams and all these are stress which keeps bouncing in families. So getting a schedule and uh, the best to tell you what works with this group of people is rewards and incentives. I just cannot emphasize any bit more because rewards, not monetary, not, you know, don't, don't start, you know, dealing with money but it can be a lot to do with small favors, a star chart, something that they can gain and then be happy about and being participated. Um, that just works very well, very fast in young kids. If you have young kids at home, that's something that gets to work very well. Fear, fear is something that, um, yeah, I just cannot express again in terms of the importance that it brings because a lot of things starts from children starting to share in the name of a fear. Okay, if there's abuse going on in the family, uh, it can be anything, physical, sexual, emotional abuse. The first thing children will start to talk about is a lot of fear. And every story that they tell you are associated with fear that something happened to somebody. So-and-so is going through this. It's, it's, it's always somebody else's story and this, Fear factor keeps coming up. So we need to acknowledge this child's fear very openly and, and facilitate and validate and allow them to talk more about it. If you do that, then you get to do a plan and you know offer encouragement in terms of getting them to feel comfortable to share. Once you start doing that and then get the information and from there you will see the patterns and if it is anything beyond um, again, I'm just asking for this signs and symptoms and in terms of the triggers and actions that we can take. So that's all I'm trying to look at for today. So this would just be a first stop for you to understand and pick some pointers up. Of course, if you have any questions on this, I will take it a bit later. But definitely, if anyone is talking to you profusely about fear, nightmares, I'm not able to sleep at night, they keep waking up. Uh, often urinating and then in the pretext of leaving the room quite often. Um, these are all things that you just need to take notice of. It'll be very helpful. Okay. Yeah, this is something that's very interesting. I used to have groups where they'll say, oh, you know what, my ma'am, I just don't like this, uh, you know, my other friends. And then we will all start laughing and talking about, I mean, we get, we don't, get told, right, by our parents to say which kind of friends you should have. Who are your friends? I mean, I know back home, we all come from India and from some of us are here. And then, you know, we have a common sharing. So we are very free to choose our friends and do whatever we want. And how did we learn? How did we know how to discern from good friends from, you know, not so good? And the influence part came only with experience. And we were kind of making all the decisions. But how come when it comes to our children here, then we start saying, oh, don't, don't talk to that boy. Don't get to do this. Don't do this. So kids don't like that. I can tell you, I bet you they don't like that. It becomes such a defensive topic if you touch about their friends. So what we can do is just look at our own prejudices. If we have any, try to get rid of that first. Don't be in a hurry to go and tell them, hey, quickly make friends there. And, you know, this is the one that you should move more with. So we can avoid those kind of uh, discussions. Try to think long term and try to understand. Oh, you know, yeah, what makes you like this friend so much? What is so good about him? You know, what do you bring back? What's his family like? Um, what made you so you know, attracted to this, this particular group of people? What's the common, you know, thing that you guys have as a group? So once you start taking active interest in understanding, children themselves know how to make decisions from there and they will change. Give them the time, give them the arena and the inputs that you want to just be cool about it and and they themselves will know and say oh you know what mom i just realized yeah that is after all you know you're, you're you're more wise i probably shouldn't have done that and and from there they will start moving so if, if you have children coming back to you to talk about friends so things that you can think about 
Yeah, I just have a couple of slides more. I mean, yeah, I hope I'm not, yeah, not going too deep into it and it's useful. So we'll just look at a couple of more and take questions from there. This is something so interesting. You know, have you ever been in a position where two of your kids or anybody else starts fighting? The minute a fight starts, right? And then you just go, what do you ask? What's the first thing you ask? I know I can't hear you guys, but the first thing is sometimes you walk in and you say, what happened? And that's all you have to ask. Oh, you will become a jury in between you. They will make you a judge. They say, oh, she did that, he did that, I did this, you did that. And the fight starts escalating and escalating. So if you want to take a neutral stand, I mean, all these things we know, but how do we do it? I mean, what do we do, right? When we're caught in it, there's no time to go for resources, preference, come back and then be the best mom. You have to deal with it, right or wrong. You have to teach them. So what you can be is, I mean, if it is your manner that you learn, uh, you know, raising children to be non-judgmental, and to also to be able to respect their space and, you know, give them kind of non-threatening words and trying to understand or distract and tell them what you see. You could, you could just say that I feel, I mean, I, I'm seeing that both of you are very distressed. Both of you are very angry. And then the minute you go neutral, they calm down. The escalation steps down. Then they come to a, a tone of sharing or at least talking about it. Otherwise, they will just go on and on and on. The fight will not stop. And then the throwing starts, the heating, and it just starts to escalate. So if you want to de-escalate, not just children, but anywhere, you should be able to move them, give them a bit of space, de-escalate, and look at the, the, the cues for non-verbal. That, that'll be very helpful. Yeah, this is exactly what I was trying to stress on. You can distract rather than just starting to react. The minute you start reacting, then that particular behavior that's undesirable keeps coming back. And, and if you start giving them alternatives, I'm sure you'd have tried if you had babies at home, right? Young kids that cry for something. The minute you take that out and then bring something else, or oh, they will start to smile and turn around. So that's from even being a you know very few months old babies. So they themselves know exactly you know how to attention seek, what to do, what comes when they want. So if their behavior gets dangerous, all this is on a, on a family setting. The minute it escalates and it gets beyond you and you think that it is not something that you can manage, then that's the time that you should not shy or, or think twice about seeking help or at least talking to somebody about it. Yeah, and that there are ways to do that. Um, gentle restraint, meaning I'm not saying about, you know, taping and putting them across and all that, just, just leaving them in their space, uh, a bit of a timeout where they can stay there. And then if they respect you, they will take the time out and step out after 10 minutes. So that's something that you can start practicing uh, if you have some, uh, you know, a behavior modification plan. I mean, those are big words and you don't need that for today, but those are the plans that we do in terms of behavior modification and rectification work where they learn to unlearn things that they've learned and then they start behaving in a different manner. Reward, uh, we, have, we have said that we really want to pay a lot of attention to rewards in terms of um, the opposite, the positive of it. No time up, but you can look at a star chart or uh, giving them, you know, tasks and helping them, you know, bring those positive behaviors a lot more. So what you need to do is to be a magnet that attracts a lot of positive behavior and keep re-emphasizing that. So they want to do that and be in your good books. They want to run to get those rewards from you. Uh, I used to know families where children will say, oh, if I go to school, uh, you know, yeah, parents, please go meet that particular teacher. I used to wonder why. And uh, they will always say that, oh, this teacher speaks a lot good about me. She has great things to share about me. And uh, she's the only one who has positive remarks. So you, you know that, right? I mean, children are very attracted to having something, you know, like good remarks from them. So you can praise you can give them rewards in terms of your yeah, non-monetary and you will see magic works. Yeah, last but not least, teach by example. Anything that you want from them is for something that we need to do and being honest, dependable, responsible, that you know we can listen to them. Um, most of the best things that I've learned is by listening to children and young people as they talk. So we jot down, we talk to them, and we see that works best. 
and take away things seriously. Being consistent, yep. I think I'll be just running this very quick and, and, and we see if we have other questions coming. Making a distinction between the child and the behavior. Okay, that's something you can probably take note of. You're dealing with the behavior and not, not the child. So you're not going to, um, yeah, start treating the child different because it's the behavior that you want modification in. Honest, yep. I don't have to emphasize enough about being tolerant. I mean, yeah, you can read this. Okay, self-esteem. I think with that, yeah, I will be closing soon. Self-esteem is the most important in terms of, yeah, for a person to feel good about the emotions. Where we are all bringing this is to the emotional kind of wellness we're talking about, right? And we're trying to say that the emotional wellness is towards me uh, is socially and in terms of mental well-being. So coming and connecting that is uh, remember to work towards the self-esteem of children, that they demonstrate competence and, and they will be feeling good about themselves. So anything that you do to make them feel good about themselves is going to be something that you're sowing a seed. It's going to be very helpful as they become adults and start dealing with relationships and their own families later on. With that, yes, yeah, I've just done the part of children and youth. We can take questions from there. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mrs. Lakshmi. Uh, any questions from the um, audience? Uh, Kala, if, yes. sorry. Uh, Kala, can I just take a minute to sure, kind of sure. play that video, which wasn't playing earlier, which is a sure. good reinforcement sure. what Lakshmi you can. and I shared about uh, you know, providing empathy and providing that space as a part of a coping mechanism. Sure. Thank you. Hello, uh, can you unmute yourself, Dr. Ramnik? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do, uh, can you hear uh, the video? We can see the video. Can you play now? So you okay, can it's okay. Your we can audio. replay it. Sure, sure. Uh, just, just give me a second. I'll just kind of replay it. Again, it's muted. I'm so sorry for this. Uh, just
I think there is some technological problem that the video is not playing to the full. I'm so sorry. I can share the link with everyone later. Maybe you can just kind of share it further. My apologies. Just happened. Uh, that was uh, thanks. Um, any questions? I think uh, I don't see any questions here. And thanks, uh, Dr. Ramnik. As you said, emotionally health does not mean happy all the time. So sad and anxiety are normal. So it, it means uh, you know one needs to be aware of the emotions and needs to control it, listen, empathize, and validate validate strengths. Uh, thanks for that and uh, uh, coming to this is and where your important point is there is a difference between the mental illness and the mental wellness right and uh, to mrs lakshmi and i think you spoke in detail about managing the children with challenging behaviors and many of us here could relate in daily life what you have spoken about it right and the few points is distract rather than react and you uh, never meet violence with violence, reward rather than punish. And uh, as you said, it's very important how you talk to your children, how we talk to them affects their self-esteem, self-worth and self-image. Just make sure you respond, convey caring messages. And especially I think when it is teens, it's always a challenge. You always keep hearing, please mom, please mom, right? And that many of us would forget that. And thanks to you, and may I now invite uh, Shweta uh, to do the vote of thanks. Thank you so much, Ramnik ma'am and Lakshmi ma'am. Thank you for your wonderful and valuable insights. Presentation was very, very well explained. I would say that uh, the biggest takeaway from today's session is that we all should vote that we will tackle and deal with any of the factors in our surroundings which is affecting our happiness. So on that note, thank you so much that giving us this uh, valuable insights. And uh, I'm sure that we will follow that and we will understand that how much the emotional, social and mental well-being is necessary for all of us. Thank you so much. And uh, Mrs. Lakshmi and uh, uh, Dr. Kamli, will you be sharing the presentation with our members? Uh, yes, I'm happy to do that. And as also, I think somebody has posted a link in the chat. Uh, that is the Brené Brown's, uh, I think, video on empathy, which I was trying to play on my slides. Okay. So I, I would I really request everyone. It's not a long one. It's just a few minutes, but it's beautifully done. It's still a gold standard for us when we're trying to talk about empathy. Uh, yes, we'd be more than happy to share the presentation. And just to add on, uh, uh, between me and Lakshmi, we have actually kind of pooled and uh, developed, you know, kind of set of resources, which I could be kind of, I'm happy to kind of, uh, we're happy to share it with you in case the members would like to kind of make access to those resources. Those are major helplines in Singapore, the counseling centers and so on. Uh, where you can just give a call and put in a query and, and seek further help and support. Absolutely, yeah. We're, we're very happy to uh, share the slides and resources and at any time and anyone just wants to you know, reach us in terms of support or even wanting to know, you know in terms of the way ahead, yeah, we are ready to be of any help possible. Uh, that, that, that's so nice of you and uh, thanks to both of you for spending your valuable time. And uh, I think you have gone in detail to explain that's nice. And uh, we wait for the presentation and we share it with the members. And thank you so much for also sharing the resources. I think it will be useful as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Lovely evening. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. With this, we come to the end of this thank session. You. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.